Wow, is this loud? Yes. It's very loud. How you doing, brother? You're a good-looking man. Dude, he's a tall, good-looking man. He is. I'm not ashamed to say it. Amen. It's good to see you here. I am not the pastor here, okay? Uh, pastor Ron and Pastor Sharon are in South Africa ministering this week. And so uh, I, on behalf of them, I say thank you for coming today. Amen? Uh, this is my 25th trip to Kenya since 2010. And uh, so I am, uh, uh, I want to be a Kenyan citizen so I can be African American. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, my wife uh, did not get to travel with me this time. Uh, she uh, may, uh, will be back in July and hopefully she'll get to travel with me then. Uh, and my daughter as well. My daughter loves Kenya. She wants to actually come here and live. Now she's only 17, so daddy is not ready to let her go to Kenya. <laughs> Amen. She loves children. The happiest to ever see my daughter is when she's here and working with kids. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I, I tell you, it's, it's a blessing. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. Our hearts are for you. Father, we thank you right now. We know as much as we love you, Father, you loved us first. Amen. You love us without any hesitation. You loved us, Father, without any reservations. Father, you, you said while we were yet sinners, you came and died for us. And Father, for that, if, if we had nothing else to thank you and praise you for, that alone is worth a million thanks a day. Amen. Father, we love you. We ask you today to anoint my lips to speak. Yes. Father, and I thank you right now that you anoint everyone's ears to hear, not just the ears on the side of their head, but the ears of their spirit yes. to receive the word today. Yes. Father, I thank you. I, I did not come to entertain, but Father, to, to reveal your word. And Father, Amen. reveal yourself to this church today. Yes. Father, reveal yourself. Father, I thank you right now as I'm ministering the word. Father, some people may take different pieces and parts and it may minister to them in a different way. Father, have your will in this service today. Amen. Lord, heal those who need healing. Father, th those who've been uh, in their physical bodies have been challenged physically, Lord. Father, we say healing right now to every back and shoulder. Yes. To every organ in their body, to every muscle, to every nerve ending. God, we thank you right now from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. I speak healing into their lives. Father, I thank you that their minds are strong and powerful, God. I think that their minds can remember names, dates, faces, and places. God, I thank you right now, the Lord, it's not your will for us to receive uh, uh, what the world has offers us. We don't receive sickness and disease. It may come, but we, do, we refuse to let it stay in our lives. I speak to the places of barrenness. I speak to the places of poverty and lack. I speak right now to the places of confusion. And I declare that there is healing, peace, and joy. In the name of Jesus. Somebody give my Jesus a shout this morning. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Someone, uh, I will be 50 this year. And uh, I know I look young, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> it's a miracle. And so I put these, these glasses on the other day, and somebody said, oh, you're getting old. You're wearing reading glasses. I, I said, no, they're wisdom glasses. <laughs> I, I, you know what, my eyes, uh, I, I will be 50 in December, uh, December 12th, so you remember my birthday, okay? Yeah, yeah. Do not pour water over my head. <laughs> that is a Kenyan thing, not an American thing, okay? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I will be 50, and so what I've started doing now is speaking over my eyesight. I want my eyes to get better, amen? I, 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 I remember waking up one day and going, man, somebody moved changed the print it got smaller but you know what I started speaking over my eyes and I speak over my eyes every day that I have 2020 vision amen. perfect vision amen. amen speak over yourself sing over yourself pray over yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs make a melody in your hearts amen, amen. And that's not even the message here we go Proverbs chapter 11 Proverbs chapter 11 you've got your Bible Proverbs chapter 11 follow along with us today if not they will bring the uh, words up on the, the scripture up on the screen in December of 2017 getting ready to go into the new year 
I, I remember seeing my office one day, really minding my own business, and God started speaking to me about outreach and evangelism. Outreach and evangelism. And God stirred inside of me a, a, a desire to see lost souls saved like I have never seen before. I've had a desire to see the lost come to Jesus. But something was imparted inside of me to see this like I've never seen before. I have all of a sudden I had a hunger and a thirst for those who have been out in the world, those who have been, been uh, straight away from the Lord, those who have never known the Lord, all of a sudden I could not think about anything but lost souls day and night. Now let me ask you something. How many of you were raised in the church? Anybody? I mean, you were, you were born saved. Come on, anybody? Now, before, see, for the rest of us, see, we had an experience along the way. I was 18 years old when, when the people who are now my senior pastors... I was 18 years old, and they had been ministering to me for over a year to come to Jesus. But, see, I, I had allowed Satan to condemn me because of my, my past. You think, well, how much past can you have in 18 years? When I was 13 years old, I went to jail. I did not get out until I was 15 years old. You understand jail? Okay. Just want to make sure. Because you're staring at me, and you're hiding your wallets now. <laughs> Like, what is he about to do? No. But when I was 18 years old, the devil had lied to me so much that I had received a spirit of condemnation. And I was happy for everybody else who could get born again. But I felt like I could not because of the things I had done. And it took two years from the time I was 16 to the time I was 18 years old for me to realize that, and, and to really feel the grace of God. And I remember one night I went to... Um, to uh, my, who are now my pastors, Pastor Brian and Rhonda, I went to their home, and they, they were youth pastors at the church that my wife attended, my wife now. Uh, she attended that church, and all the teenagers would get together and pray every Friday night. And I remember going over there, and when they would start to pray, I would leave the room because I felt so unworthy to be in the presence of God. I felt like, oh, that's, that's good for them, but I could never have what they have. See, my wife was born, I think she was, her first words were in tongues. <laughs> her first legible words were a prophecy, I think, I, I don't know. My, my wife, if she is the fourth, I, I kid her, I told her she's the fourth man in the Trinity. <laughs> the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and Amy. <laughs> See, she was born in church, she was born in the things of God. My wife is a powerful preacher, she is so anointed and so awesome. But for the rest of us, we had an experience. And I'm grateful today for those who took time to minister the gospel to me. Amen. I was not an easy one to, to convert. I here's, here's the sad thing. I believed in Jesus. I believed in God, but I believed that Jesus came to die for good people. Jesus came to die for the worst of the worst. Paul even said this. He said that, that of sinners, I am the chief. Oh, yes. And if God can save him, God can save me, and God can save anyone. Amen. 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 So I, I want to share with you some things that God started revealing to me uh, in, in this past December and through the first of the year. So I remember getting up in front of my church, and I, I did a little survey in service, and I asked this question. I asked, now, the, the, we, we have three campuses, and I was ministering in one of our campuses where, where a lot of the younger uh, of our church uh, members go. I remember asking this question. How many of you in this room have ever ministered your faith in Jesus to somebody else? And, of course, I was looking for a lot of hands, and about 10 hands went up. Out of about 400 people in that room, about 10 hands went up. And I said, how many, how many of you have ever pray, led somebody to the Lord, praying, them with, praying with them to receive Jesus? Two hands. One up. Two hands. And I asked them, I said, I, it was a, a young man and a young woman, and I asked them their age. They were 30 years old. No one from 30 to or below had ever witnessed to anybody their faith in Jesus Christ. And that started, that revealed to me that I had done, I needed to get our church soul-minded. 
Let me ask you something. Are you soul-minded this morning? Are you, when you look at somebody and, and you know the way they live and you know the, that, that they're, they're, what comes out of their mouth and the life they live, if it's not for Jesus, do you have a burden for them? Because I tell you, one thing God did to me during that time is when I wake up in the morning, I say, when my wife and I pray, we say this, God, who's on your heart today? <laughs> God, who's on your heart today? Because, you know, if I go to a restaurant and, and, and there's somebody there that uh, uh, needs Jesus, I want to be sensitive enough to God when he's leading me to go talk to somebody to seize that opportunity. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me, let me just tell you this. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you're praying, say this. Say, Lord, who's on your heart today? Who can I minister to today? There's some days that God leads me to some people and some days not. I want to be sensitive to God so much that when he sends me to minister to somebody, I go minister to him. Amen. Amen. So Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that wins, say wins. wins. Oh, that was weak. He that wins, say wins. wins. He that wins souls is wise. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have, have, have uh, been what they call soul winning before. Anybody? You've been soul winning before? Thank you. Anybody going out on the streets and, and ministering? Let, let me tell you what. When I first got saved, when I first got saved, we had these, this, con this, this conception about uh, soul winning. Okay? So here's what we did. First, we, we, we tried different things to win people to Jesus. We, first, we had these little things called tracks. You remember tracks? Yeah. Okay, so we take tracks and we go stand out on street corners. And uh, we would, is it okay if I'm down here? Okay. We we go and we pass out tracks, and it was just a little track, and it just had a, had the gospel of Jesus Christ on it. And if somebody stopped, we would say, "Hey, uh, let me just share this with you. Let me let me talk to you about Jesus." So so then we got a little more crazy, and we started going door to door. Anybody ever been door to door? Yeah. You you man in America, people will cut you. <laughs> If you not come knocking on the wrong door, you know what I mean? So, so we'd go and we'd knock on doors. People would come to the door and would say, uh, we're from uh, the local church here. And we would like to, to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. And people would slam the doors in our face. <laughs> and I remember uh, after we'd pass out tracks on the street, we'd have to go back and pick up all the tracks that people had, had taken and balled up and threw them on the ground. I've been to, I remember going to Honduras a couple of years ago, and I, in Honduras, I mean in Peru, we went to a soccer stadium where there were about 30 or 40,000 people in there watching the game, and we stood outside after the game, and, and we passed out tracks, and we were able to, to pray with some people, and, and, and so sometimes these things work, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. But I want you to look at the scripture again, for the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. See, when we are the righteousness of God, there should be something in us. When, when, how many of you like it, a, apples? Anybody like apples? Okay, apples. Now, if you go to an apple tree and there's no apples on it, there's no fruit to enjoy. See, when people come to a Christian, they want to know that there's some fruit in your life that they can enjoy. The tree never gets to enjoy its own fruit. It just produces the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People enjoy the fruit that you produce. Amen. An apple, you know not see an apple tree sitting there eating an apple. People enjoy the fruit that you produce. And when you were saved and born again, I, look, when I, when I first got saved, I, I, I had a brand new spirit, but I had the same old mind. I came in with, with my, I brought my anger into Christianity. I brought some of my doubt and my fears into Christianity. I was saved but listen, I had a new spirit, but I had to deal with the same old mind. Mm -hmm. I had to get my mind renewed, and some of us are still in that renewal process. My mind is still being renewed. I've been in full-time ministry 24 years now as a pastor, but my mind is continually having to be renewed. And this is one of those things that I have to be renewed in is about being sensitive to lost souls. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the scripture again. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins... Souls. How many of you like to win? I need to see all hands. 
Okay, let, let me just ask it, ask it this way. How many of you like the blues? <laughs> there, there, now I got all the hands. Okay, everybody participated that time. Nobody likes to lose. And I'm going to tell you something. When you use the term win, that usually means there is opposition to what you're doing. Yes. He that wins a soul. He that wins. See, if you want to win, that means that there's opposition. Sometimes there's opposition in the person you're ministering to. They may be atheists. They may be agnostic. They may be of a different religion or a different denomination that does not believe like you. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to convince them that what they've been believing wrong needs to change to believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. He that wins souls. See, we're not trying to win them from them. We're trying to win them from the devil. Yes. He says, it's he that wins. Now here's where we get, here's where I got soul winning wrong. See, I thought soul winning was not successful until somebody let me pray with them to receive Jesus. I had this thing that I was a failure as a soul winner unless somebody, unless I, I went past their doubt, past their unbelief, past their fear. I, I, was, I was in a place that I was unsuccessful as a soul winner, unless somebody let me pray with them and they received Jesus. But that is not what the scripture says. He does not say he that converts someone is wise. It does not say he that prays with somebody to receive Jesus is soul winning. No, soul winning is different than praying the prayer of salvation. Because I'm going to tell you something, not every one of us are evangelists. But every one of us are soul winners. Yes. 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 He says, he that wins souls, not spirits. I'm convinced of this, that sometimes if you minister to somebody, you have to go to get to their spirit. You've got to go through their soul. Yes. Now, their spirit is what we're trying to get to. But you've got to go through the, what is the soul of man? The soul of man is defined in three things. The mind, the will, and one more, emotions. How many of you know somebody who's very emotional? <laughs> got drama in their life all the time. <laughs> Cries all the time. Always got some dilemma going on. Somebody hurt me. Somebody hates me. Somebody dresses better than me. Somebody said this about me. Sometimes to get to their spirit, we've got to go through their soul. See, a few, few months ago, after I left you uh, in, in March, uh, I, was in, I went to Ireland and ministered there with a team for 10 days. And we ministered on the streets. We ministered in crusades. And we did not know how those people in Ireland were going to receive the gospel of Jesus because they, their, their, their religion is Catholic. Catholic. It's Catholicism. And even if they are not a devout Catholic, if you talk bad about Catholics or Catholicism or the, the Catholic Church, you, you're going to get in a fight. So you had to be real sensitive about how you, you approach somebody and, and preach the gospel to them. And you know that here's the thing I found out about the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. It sells itself. See, we're not called to, to convert somebody. We're called to present the gospel. Amen. 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 Some people walk away and think they're failures when they don't pray with somebody. See, he says this, he that wins souls. He that goes through the mind, the will, and the emotions to get to the soul. Let me, let me tell you something. I, I noticed something about Kenyon. And, and is anybody an evangelist in here? You go out on the streets and you minister anybody. Good, because I want to offend you. Okay. Because I have seen... Let, let, me, let me paint a picture of what Kenyan evangelism looks like. Okay? You're not going to be offended, right? Y'all okay? Yes. Say, I love you, Pastor. I love you, Pastor. <laughs> Only the first three rows said it. I need people sugar bear. I need you to say it back. <laughs> chocolate bear, I see you back here. <laughs> Fred's, Fred's my chocolate bear. I love Fred. I need to say, I love you, Pastor. I love you, Pastor. 
So one day we were sitting out in a little cafe, and we were on uh, uh, the other side of, of Nairobi, and, and it, was, it was really hot, and we were sitting out there and drinking. You remember this, friend? We were sitting out there across from the, the court, Macadero Courthouse, and, and uh, we were sitting out, and so this guy came out doing evangelism, okay? So in order to be a Kenyan evangelist, you need a bullhorn. You know what a bullhorn is? You talk into it, you, no, actually, to be an evangelist in Kenya, you've got to have to scream into this megaphone. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. You've got to hold the Bible up in one hand, and you've got to be real coordinated to be a Kenyan evangelist. You've got to hold the Bible in one hand, you've got to have the megaphone in the other and know how to scream and read at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> have you done this, brother? No? Okay. So here's what Kenyan evangelism looks like. And I remember asking, I was sitting with the police chief on that side of town. I was sitting with him and said, do you understand anything he's saying? He says, no, not a word. <laughs> Ma'am, you okay? Have you done this? Have you got a megaphone in that purse? No? Okay. And so I give them an A for effort, but maybe a D for pre presentation. Now see, when I was in Ireland a few weeks ago, we, we, we ministered in many different ways, but I found the most effective way to minister was one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. One-on-one. -on -one. When I was ministering to a crowd, I lost the crowd. But when I was ministering one-on-one, -on -one, we got them every time. True. Now, if God leads you to minister a different way, let me, let me tell you this. I remember one time I was, I used to work in the medical field, okay? And I used to do, uh, be a respiratory technician. And I was going to see some patients in their home. And I remember one day, and this was on, on a, a very rough side of town. And so I remember walking by and I heard the conversation. There were six uh, young black men that were talking, but I could hear the conversation. One of them was telling about the, the, uh, his sexual conquest. He was probably lying, but he was telling all his friends, all his friends were going, yeah, you know, and they were just, just all into it. And God said, go minister to them. I was like, devil, get behind me. <laughs> you know that's not the devil, right? The devil would never tell you to sow a seed in somebody's spirit. And so I went back over and I said, guys, excuse me. And I was real nervous. Not, not my usual bold self. I was real nervous, but I said, guys, I was walking by and I felt like, this, like God told me to come and tell you that he loves you. And I could tell that they all of a sudden disconnected from their former conversation and listened. It was just six guys right there and I ministered to them, Jesus, and I said, it, it, when I got through pre presenting the simple gospel, maybe like two minutes, I said, I didn't ask him if I could pray for him. I said, I'm going to pray for you. You pray after me. And the weirdest thing happened. The guy who had been telling the story about his latest sexual conquest said, can we hold hands? Wow. It's like, yeah. Let's repeat after me. Jesus. Jesus. And we prayed, and all six of them received Jesus right there. Amen. Now, that was being spirit-led in my evangelism. When I was a youth pastor, we, we took 100 teenagers between 14 and 18 to a, a, a place called Myrtle Beach. And so at the end of the trip, they wanted to go do street ministry. Myrtle Beach is the uh, East Coast teenage runaway capital of the United States. And so a lot of the people that hang out in the back alleys, they're teenagers. They've run away from home. And so I remember splitting the group up. And, and I let uh, one guy, he took a group of 50, and they went down the strip passing out tracks. And I took my group, and we went to on the back alley toward, in a dark area, and we sat there and prayed in the Spirit. And when we all got together at the end, we started talking about the effectiveness of what we did. And here's what I found out. Passing tracks out is successful. And so is being spirit-led. You can never go wrong in any kind of evangelism you do. 
Because here's what happened. While they were out passing out tracts, we went back there and we just prayed in the spirit. We said, God, lead us to the person right now who needs you. And so there's 50, me and 50 teenagers sitting in this dark alley. <laughs> Been there, right? And so somebody would come by and they'd look at me. Is that the one? It's like, no. And about 20 minutes went, like, went by and you could tell that these teenagers were getting restless. And all of a sudden, this young man walked by, wasn't wearing a shirt, wearing his jeans down, and had his boxers out, and see all of his, all of his backside, you know, and he's walking, and the Spirit of God said, that's the one. And so here's, I said, that's the one, and all of a sudden, 50 teenagers stood up and started following this kid down the beach. <laughs> I mean, if, if anybody would ever be intimidated, it should have been that guy. 50 white kids following this guy around, you know. And so we, I said, excuse me. And he turned around, and there's 50 people, 51 people staring at him, you know. And they're all, like, chomping at the bit. They're, so I just said, hey, uh, we, I just want to, uh, when you walk by, I said, I felt like the Spirit of God wanted me to just come minister to you. And he was very resistant to what we were saying. He did not want to hear this. But he listened because he was being courteous. And so by the time we got through presenting the gospel to him, I said this, I said, all you're thinking about right now is your grandmother. Because your grandmother told you before you left and ran away that she was praying for you. And you didn't like the fact that she was praying for you. And he said, how did you know that? I said, because it's a small thing to everybody else. It's a big thing to you. And God wants you to know he knows everything about you. And that young man received Jesus right there. Amen. He used my phone to call home and say he was coming home. It's just that one change. So let, let me share something with you. Let's, let's look at some more scripture here real quick. Okay? Because even if somebody doesn't receive Jesus, you have sown a seed of the gospel. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says this. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See, whenever you tell somebody about Jesus, you, you may not pray with them right there, but you sow the seed. And here's what you need to do. We need to pray over the seeds we sow in the gospel. If we go and minister to somebody and they don't receive Jesus right then, just know that a seed has been planted. And you pray, God, now send somebody to water that seed. Because here's what I know about us, the seed of the gospel. It brings harvest. Amen. What is the seed? The seed uh, 1 Peter 1.23 says this, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Listen, there's, there, there are corruptible seeds that you can sow into somebody. You can sow lies and discontent. You can sow, sow complaints and, 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 and murmurings. You can sow bad seed in them, or you can sow the word of God. When you sow the word, it brings a harvest. Well, what is the seed? Luke 8, 11 says, now the parable in the story, Jesus talking about the parable of the seeds and where you sow them at. He says this, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Let me tell you, one time I invited a friend, Sandy, uh, years ago. I was actually in college at the time, and I invited Sandy uh, to, to eat with me. So Sandy and I went to this restaurant. And Sandy's sitting across the table from me. I got my little pocket Bible, because I'm real spiritual. Never leave home without it. Got, got, I had my little pocket Bible, and I was sharing the gospel with her. <coughs> and I caught somebody out of the corner of my eye. There was this young Hawaiian girl. She worked at the restaurant. She was eating before she clocked in to go to work. And I could feel she was listening in on our conversation. And I, I, gave, I gave Sandy all my scripture. I told her about my conversion. I told her about how good God is, how much God loves her, how much God can forgive her. And I said, don't you want to receive Jesus? She said, no. And the little girl sitting at the table beside me says, she said, I do. <laughs> I was planting seed one way and just scattered some another place and the girl got born again. Amen. Because the gospel is that good. Amen. 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 See, I believe I believe in evangelism. And I believe this. Listen to me. In the 19, early 1900s there was a revival, Azusa Street revival in the United States. Okay, 
It was by an, Af an African American man uh, who started that, and uh, it was it just grew and grew and grew, and people from all over the world came to be part of that revival. Then after that, there came the 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 uh, the uh, evangelism age through the early 1900s, through the mid 1900s. Then after that. There came the, the healing anointing with the evangelists. So people started doing healing anointings. And then there, we were introduced in the 60s and the 70s to the teaching anointing. And I believe it's coming back around. I believe the next big anointing you're going to see is going to be evangelistic. Because, I listen, I've been all over the world. And I can tell you the darkest place I've ever been to is not some place in Africa, not some place in Haiti, not some place over in Asia. I can tell you the darkest place I've ever been to is Europe. I mean, it, uh, those of you from Europe, you can probably attest. If you're born again and from Europe, congratulations, you are a minority. <laughs> but I'm telling you, something is about to change. A, f a friend of mine that when I was in uh, Ireland, a friend of mine from Oklahoma told me, he said a, a local church in Oklahoma just invested a million dollars to send people to Paris to start ministering the gospel. Something is about to happen. Amen. Something is happening. And I believe that the gift in the, the, of the evangelist and the ministry of evangelism is about to just be the next, I won't say the next big thing like it's a fashion, but it's the next big move of God. Let me show you this. Turn, Acts 1.8 says this, But you shall receive power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and into the other most parts of the earth. <clears throat> Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It is it's the what? The power of God. Everybody in church, everybody in the charismatic, tongue-talking churches, God, we want to see you move. God, we want to see your power. You see the power when you present the gospel. Yes, amen. You see the power when, see, we want to see God move. God wants to see us move. Yes, amen. Somebody tweet that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting on God to move, but God is trying to move us. Don't leave here and go buy a megaphone. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do I want you to go home and say God give me a heart for the lost when my wife and I we, we were blessed to be able to, to move into a, a nice house we lived in a very small house and we were blessed to be able to move into a house and I said God if you're giving us this house I want you to give us this neighborhood and so I started looking around at all the adults I could minister to and all of a sudden kids just started coming to my house. Kids. It's like, God, I ain't asked for kids. <laughs> I'm looking at the adults and God's bringing kids. They're, they're, I mean, I'm like, I, I don't know what to do with all these kids, so I bought a basketball goal. And I put a basketball goal up in my yard, and kids are out there. I mean, I'm not even home. And they're out there in my yard. They're tearing my grass up. <laughs> my yard looks terrible. And then I said, oh, okay, God, I see what you're doing. I told you on this neighborhood, you gave me the kids. For eight years, every, every Monday for eight years, I ministered to those kids. Amen. And every, every once in a while, I'll run into those kids, and most of them are still serving God today as adults. Amen. I got a few that I got a whooping line, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Why? Well, because the word works. Amen. The only time the seed doesn't work is when it's not sown. The only, let me say it again. The only time the seed doesn't work is when it's not sown. A farmer who does not sow seed is not a farmer. We are Christians. Look, look at Matthew chapter 4. Let's look there real quick. Matthew chapter 4. Are y'all okay? Yes. So Pastor Ron told me I had two hours. Are y'all okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let me go there myself. 
Matthew chapter 4. Let's look in verse 19, I believe it is. Verse 18. Mark 4, I mean Matthew 4, 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. What are they doing with their nets? Casting. casting. Watch. Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you great preachers. No. Follow me, and I'll make you anointed musicians. No. Follow me, and I'll make you great pastors. Mm -hmm. Follow me, and I'll make you apostles. Mm -hmm. Jesus' purpose of calling people is so they can learn to reach people. Yes. The first thing he told disciples, the first thing that drew people out of the boats and out of their profession, out of their comfort zone, is when Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. See, I, can I tell you all a secret? Don't tell anybody else, okay? <laughs> See, I, I want to be as well-known of a pastor as I can. Here and at home. And, I, and I'll be honest with you. It used to be because I wanted the, the fame and notoriety. I want to be known because I want people to know. I want people to know me in, pr in prison. I want people to know me in the streets. Because that's who I'm sowing the seed to. I want people to know that, that Pastor Philip just, just doesn't preach to a saved crowd. He preaches to an unsaved crowd. Amen? Now, now let's, let's go on because Jesus didn't end there. He, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now, can you imagine? You've been a fisherman all your life. Your brother's a fisherman. Your dad's a fisherman. Your granddaddy was a fisherman. Your great-granddaddy was a fisherman. Everybody in your life, you don't know nothing but fishing. And then somebody comes to you and presents to you Hey, you want to fish for something different? Let's fish for men. Can you imagine these guys get their nets and say, yeah, well, let's go catch all we can. <laughs> can you see them walking through the streets and say, there's a group throwing nets over people? <laughs> now, how many of you have been fishing before? Anybody? You've been fishing? Y'all have not been fishing? I'll be honest with you. I fished when I was growing up, but it bores me now. <laughs> but here's the thing. Some people fish with nets and some people fish with what they call a rod. It's just one person catching one fish at a time. See, there's some evangelists out there who catch large groups at one time, but for the most of us, we don't have nets. We just catch one at a time. Yeah. Now, I want you to look at this because the story's not over there. He goes on and says, And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going from there, he saw another two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In a ship with Zebedee and their, their father, what, what are they doing with their nets? Amen. Now, what were the first two brothers doing? Casting. And what are these two brothers doing? Amen. What were the first two doing? Casting. And what are these two doing? Amen. See, sometimes you've got to catch them and sometimes you've got to mend them. <laughs> sometimes you've got to catch fish, but sometimes those fish don't really come in. Sometimes men don't come in until you, when we go back to that first scripture... He who wins souls is wise. See, a lot of times you, go, you might minister to somebody and you, you present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And they, they say, well, here, here's what they do. They start him with everything they don't believe. <laughs> right? If you, minister, if you minister to somebody, you know, they're going to tell you what they don't believe. Hey, brother, Jesus loves you. Come on up here. Come on. <laughs> so I, I, I come up to this center right here, okay? Will you play the role of a sinner? Okay. <laughs> Just for now. Just momentary. Okay. So I come up here to him and I say, hey, I'm Philip. Hey, uh, I just want to, if you got a minute, I just want to share the gospel with you. Yeah, just, I just want to tell you about Jesus, something that's done for me. And so I, I share with him the gospel and then what he, he does, he says, well, what I believe is, well, what are we doing? The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. Well, we're, I'm getting a piece of his mind. Mm -hmm. I'm finding out where his mind is at. If I can change his mind, I can get to his heart. Amen. 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 He says, well, I, I don't say, say, well, I don't really believe in God. 
You don't believe in God. Hey, you know what? I know I was there too. I remember there was a time in my life I didn't believe in God. But he sent his son Jesus. Say, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus. Okay. He's good. He's good. He knew exactly what I was going to say. And so I said, we know there are other religions in the world. I said, but this is the only religion in the world that where the God sacrificed for you, every other religion asks you to sacrifice for them. Yeah. <coughs> He, he, he would say, I grew up Muslim. I grew up Baptist. I don't care what you grew up. The gospel is for every generation Amen. and every denomination and every nation. Amen. Every tribe, every tongue can get the gospel because God didn't make it hard. and made it easy. Amen. And I'll tell him, I said, look, look, there's a place in Romans that says that if you will believe, now believe is where? I have to get him to believe here. Yeah. And then he receives Jesus here. Yeah. With the mouth Confession is made to salvation, but with the heart is where you believe. So I can't get to there until I go through here first. See, another situation is I may walk up to him, and I may not have to deal with his mind. He may be even believe in Jesus, but he, he, he says, well, well, if God is so good, why, why are there storms and earthquakes and tornadoes and death and, all, and pestilence and all this stuff? Why is all that? And I, how, how, you know, I was like, you know, I said, God had created a perfect world. A perfect place for man and woman. And what he, did, what he did is he gave man the right to choose to serve him or not. Yes. I said when man did not choose to serve him, Adam, the first man, chose to disobey a simple commandment not to eat of a certain fruit from a certain tree in the garden. I said it, it introduced sin into the world. I said, but I'll tell them, but the Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief, the Bible says the thief who is Satan comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. You're blaming God for something Satan does. But Jesus came that you may have life and life more abundantly. Amen. Now, by your head, we're going to pray. No. <laughs> no, but then, but see, mind, will, and emotions. I, I, I went through the mind. He says, what, what, I remember ministering to a man from England one time, and he said, and he wanted to receive Jesus, but he would not do it because if they found out at his job that he was Christian, he would be fired. The last one, the emotions. I've met more people who said, well, if God is so good, why did my grandma die? You ever, ever, ever had that? Well, you got to, sometimes, you, I, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, how old was your grandma, but, but 96, buddy, it was time. <laughs> <laughs> she lived a long life. 96 is better than a lot of people, bro. I want to say that, but I don't. Oh, come here, boo. Just a little old boy. 96, are you kidding? Okay. So what have I got to do? I've got to go past his emotion to get to a spirit. Oh, I'm sorry, man. So well, why, did, why did God take her? You ever had that? Yes. Oh, why did God take her? Well, God took her to a better place. God didn't take her. Her body may have, have gotten sick. It may have, she may have passed away. But the thing is, was she born again? Yes, she loved Jesus. Jesus said that he was going away to prepare a place for her. Now let him prepare a place for you. Let's pray. <laughs> See, the thing is, we don't have to be so stiff. Loosen up a little bit. Now, guys, if you go out witnessing, don't just chase the pretty girls. <laughs> I have seen missionary dating before. Oh, she needs Jesus. <laughs> I want to minister to her with laying on the hands and tongues. No, you, you keep that to yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Morris, you heard me, right? Okay, no missionary dating. By the way, Morris is still single. Oh, last time I was here, I was trying to auction him off. Now I'm just giving him away. Mm -hmm. Any takers? <laughs> he is a single and available. Single and ready to mingle. Okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. When God lays somebody on your heart, we need to be able to present something to them. Here, here's something I want to say. Thank you. Y'all give me my hand. Tremendous actor. Read my mind. You exactly what I was saying. 
In Matthew chapter 5, I think probably we overlook Matthew chapter 5 as being a place of evangelism. Because in verses 13 and 14, he tells us in 13 that we are salt of the earth. And then verse 14, we are the light of the world. Let me tell you something. Here's what light does. Light doesn't say a thing. Did you ever notice that? Light doesn't speak at all. If you're talking to your light bulb, you need help. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Light just shines. Amen. Amen. And see, sometimes you, you, may, you may not have one of those, those kind of personalities that just like runs up and doesn't meet a stranger and you talk to everybody and you, you just, you're just bubbly and outgoing and, and you, you just, oh, everybody's my best friend. and you, you may not have that, but here's what you can do. You can shine. Amen. You know what I've seen is effective evangelism is when people see you doing what you preach. Amen. That's the light. <laughs> then he says the salt. Here's what I know about salt. Salt, back in the, the Bible days, everybody understood this. A lot of times they would pay soldiers in salt. Salt was a very valuable commodity. What they would use, one of the things they would use salt for is they would take salt in, in a piece of fresh piece of meat and they would rub the salt in, push it all the way into the meat, rub it into the meat. Why? Why? Because it preserved the meat. They, they didn't have refrigerators to go put the meat in. But what they did have is they had salt. See, a lot of times what people need from you is something to preserve them. See, here's another thing about salt. How many of you add salt to food? Okay. Four of us. Okay. The rest of you tell a story. Okay. Sometimes when I'm eating something that's real bland, I put a little salt on there. But sometimes something tastes real bad, it needs more salt. See, there's some people you will meet in your life that you're not just salt, you're a salt shaker. You might have to put a little dash on somebody because they, they might be a little bland and bad tasting. Put a little salt on there, but somebody who's really bad, you might have to, you might not have to dash, you may need to dump. You need to decide how much salt's needed. I'm telling you, I've said all this just to say that God is putting souls on the hearts of believers. Let me share just a, one, one or two more scriptures. Are y'all okay? Yes. Are you getting something? Because y'all are real quiet. Are y'all always this quiet? Yes? I feel a little better. Thank you. Jude chapter 1. Jude 1, 23, it says, uh, verse 22, it says, And some have compassion, making a difference. Verse 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Look, there are some people who are so close to the fire that it's our job to pull them back. Another scripture, let's look at this one. We looked at it a while ago, Acts 1, 8. But you shall, now listen to this, but you shall receive power, and I'll close with this, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in, look, look at it, Jerusalem, Judea, and what's this last one? Samaria. Now let me tell you something about Samaria. When this was presented in this scripture, people were like, yeah, present the gospel of Jerusalem, yeah. Yeah, people in Jerusalem need the gospel. Yeah, they need to know Jesus. People, the, the, the church was growing in Jerusalem. Five, you can read chapter 2, 5,000. We're getting saved at a time. Man, you're talking about an explosion. He says, then he says where? Judea. Yeah, let's take it to the, to the, to the area of Judea. Everybody in Judea needs to hear it. And then he says, Samaria. And everybody's going, no, we ain't going to Samaria. <laughs> Every story we've ever read about Samaria, there's been an argument over. Because the Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews. Let me tell you what God is saying. There's going to be some times that God will send you to minister to somebody you may not be comfortable ministering to. 
John chapter 4. And I promise I'll close with this. John chapter 4. Y'all okay? Yes. Are you learning something? Yes. Are you being challenged? Yes. Okay, if you're being challenged, then I'm doing my job. Okay. John chapter 4. Verse 2, and I'm just going to paraphrase it because most of you know the story of Jesus ministering to the woman at the well. Now, everything I have said today is right here in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Jesus and his disciples had come. The Bible, the verse 4 says he needed to go through that part of Samaria and to go to a little town called Sychar. Sychar was out of the way of where he was going. Matter of fact, it was, it was a, a mountain away from where he needed to go. But what was he doing? He was being led by the Spirit to go to this place. Because this is not a place he would typically go. Plus, this is in Samaria. These are the enemies of the Jews. When Jesus said, we got to go through Samaria, I can hear the murmuring of the Jews, of, the, of his disciples. Oh, yeah, we want to go everywhere. We want to go minister to everybody except Samaria. And Jesus said, we've got to go there. Jesus comes and he's sitting at the well. And the, the, the Bible says that the disciples went into town to get food. So Jesus is there when this woman of a bad reputation comes up and Jesus is sitting there. And he, what does he do? He, he doesn't say, uh, if you've got your pocket Bible, turn with me to my book of John 3.16. No, he just, what he just said, he started talking about water. He had a normal conversation with the woman. Listen, we, when we're witnessing people, we don't have to be over spiritual. Sometimes you might need to make a friend before you make a convert. That's winning a soul. You know, sometimes you can walk up to somebody at work who may get, get treated the worst and just tell them, hey, man, I like what you're wearing today. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? Man, you just made their day. Mm -hmm. When you include somebody who's usually excluded, what'd you do? You just started winning a soul. Yeah. When somebody who has been shy and bashful and all of a sudden you come over there and you, 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 you start talking with them and have a conversation with them, man, for the first time in their life, they may feel like they have a best friend. That's winning a soul. And Jesus, what is he doing? He didn't come up and say, woman, I know who you are. I know what you are. And you better get saved or you are going to hell. <laughs> he just said, hey, uh, why are you getting water? Will you give me a cup? Sometimes you might need to invite a friend just to get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Coffees or coffee shops are the new coliseums. I mean, most of us will never preach in a 5,000 or 10,000 or 40,000 seat auditorium, but everybody can minister in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Invite a friend who's having a hard time and say, hey, meet me, this coffee. Let, meet me at Java House, I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee. And just let them talk to you. And when the opportunity, it may not be that time, but you might need to invite them back. If they feel like they can talk to you, then they'll feel like they can listen to you. So Jesus at the well. Showing us how it's done. And goes on and has this conversation. And after he has established a relationship and a rapport with this woman, he's, it, it, all of a sudden something happened. He started get, just operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, you don't have a husband. You've had seven husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. It may have been just somebody she's living with or somebody else's husband. Either way, now here, Jesus didn't say, oh, shame, you are going to hell, woman. What did he do? He, everything he said in John chapter 4 was with compassion. Amen. I mean, if you ever need to see the grace of God, it's right there in John chapter 4. Amen. Then all of a sudden, things shift in John chapter 4. This is somebody else you'll encounter. A spiritual sinner. You ever encountered a spiritual sinner before? Somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, but they know everything about the Bible. <laughs> you ever ministered to somebody like that? Yeah. You know somebody like that? Oh, they can tell you, they can quote chapter and verse. They can tell you the history. They can tell you the geography. They can tell you all these things, but they live like the devil. Because what is this woman? This woman has had, a, had a, a lifestyle of going from one man to another man to another man to another man to another man. And all, all Jesus, and then all what she said, she said, she started getting real spiritual. Well, these are the mountains of God. <laughs> this is the mountain that people will come and worship on. She started getting real spiritual all of a sudden. See, she knew 
all the right things to say, but she was not operating in those things. Mm -hmm. they, those are some of the people that we encounter. Yes. But what happened toward the end of that story? She believed in the Messiah. Amen. Listen, she believed so much that what did she do? She ran to town. She stood up on, on a sidewalk and yelled, I have just met a man. And everybody was going like, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know who you are. Oh, is it another man this week? I better go check my husband make sure he's home. <laughs> no, no, this man told me everything I've ever done. This man got into my soul, and now he's got my spirit. Amen. And she ran back out. Come on. you got to come and see this guy. She ran back out there. And they begged Jesus to stay two days. Jesus stayed with them two days in a city of their enemies, preaching the gospel. And at the end of that chapter, the men of that city, the woman sitting here, Jesus sitting here, and they came and they said, we believe not because of her testimony. We came because of her testimony, but we believe because of what we've heard. Amen. That woman became the first New Testament evangelist. She was not even a Jew. So you never know who you're going to affect. You never know what gift you're going to ignite when you present the gospel to somebody. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's all stand up. Y'all okay? You good? All right. Let's all stand. Is Gilbert still here? Can Gilbert come up? Gilbert! Oh, maybe get back there and play three chords. I know. Just close your eyes for a moment. I just want to speak right now to your to your spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we're introduced to what they call the fivefold ministry: the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And I know if I were to ask you, what what if, if you could have any ministry you want right now, some of you would say, oh, I want to be a pastor. I want to be a preacher. I want to be a teacher. I want to, I want to work with kids. I want to work with, and, and probably at the bottom of the list might be the evangelist. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what you do in life. We need to make evangelism a part of our life. Because I want to tell you, this is, the, this is the one thing that I feel like God told me. And, and, and I need you to listen and if you don't remember anything else today, remember this. God told me, he asked me, he said, what is the secret to outreach? And I said, I don't know, God. He said, the secret to outreach is reaching out. Amen. Father, I just pray right now that every person in this room is stirred. Father, stirred up in their spirit, challenged in the deepest parts of their being, God. Lord, I thank you that when they walk into a restaurant, when they go to work, when they drive through their neighborhoods and, and their apartment complexes and down the streets that they frequent and the markets they go to all the time, God, I thank you right now that they would just learn to be sensitive to your spirit. And, and if, if, Father, if you lead them to, to minister to any person, that, God, they would without a hesitation go over there and just make themselves known sometimes just by being friendly and just by, by just saying a kind word may just be all you need to start reaching that soul I'm not going to call a, a, a line of people down but I'm just going to ask you to where you're at at your seats if you 
desire that gifting of evangelism. I'm not talking about you're going to go make business cards and go quit your job and start preaching every day on the streets. I'm talking about making evangelism an everyday part of your life. And you, you say, well, I'm not, I'm not so sure about how to minister to people. I, I just want to tell you there's an anointing and a an grace that God wants to impart into your life. So if you want, that, if you want to walk in that, in that anointing and that grace, I want you to lift your hand right now where you're standing. If you, want to, if you have a heart for the lost, if you want to see lost people come to Jesus Christ, if you want to be able to, to walk in that power and that gifting, and look, it's a five-fold call, but there's a, an everyday evangelistic gift on every one of us. Right now, with your hands up, I want you to lift both hands up to the sky. I want you to lift them up, and I just want you to receive right now as I pray. Heavenly Father, I minister to every man and woman in this room. Father, no matter their age, how young or how old, Father, every person in this room has a place they can minister in their neighborhood. They can minister somewhere in their schools, God. Father, I thank you right now that, Lord, I just impart that gift of evangelism on them right now. Father, I just speak right now that they are receiving right now just an impartation, downloading. That would be a better way to say this in, in this age. Downloading uh, just, just strategies and, and, and gifts from you right now, Father, on how to reach people. God, I thank you right now when they turn around and they see somebody, they, they, they all of a sudden have a concern about what's, their, what's the condition of their soul. The smile on the face is hiding something. Lord, I thank you right now that they'll start flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Father, as Jesus dealing with the woman at the well, Father, I thank you right now they'll start flowing in the gifts of the Spirit and be able to just call people out and be able to, to, to minister to them through the grace of Jesus Christ. Father, we just love you right now. And Father, we just bless your holy name. Father, I thank you right now that, Lord, there's, I like to say it this way, I, there are thousands of churches just in Nairobi alone. But there are enough unsaved people just in Nairobi for every one of those churches to become a mega church. And let me tell you something I know about fish. I fish a lot of my life, but fish do not jump in the boat. Sometimes they have, you have to go out and catch them and bring them in. Because I want you to look at, look at me right now. Open your eyes and look at me just for a moment. We're not the only ones fishing for that soul. A lot of times when I go out fishing, I go to a, a pond or go to the lake or something, and I'm out there casting and, and, and trying to catch a fish. I look across and somebody else is trying to catch the fish I'm trying to get. See, if we as the church don't reach that soul, Satan will. <laughs> and it's our job when we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit to go out and catch those fish and bring them back into a place of safety with the Father. See, Satan wants to destroy. We want to give them new life. Yes. <clears throat> Go on, just one more time, lift your hands up. Father, we praise you right now. I'm about to turn this service over to Pastor Chris right now. You know, I just feel like the Holy Spirit just wants to do something else. <clears throat> Let's just pray in the Spirit just a moment. Come on, just lift your voices. Come on, baby. Bring just a spirit of joy on you. 
you like you've never seen that. You, you may not have ever. You even know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, the things that used to make you mad, the things that used to get under your skin, the things that, that would mess with your head now, you're going to laugh at because it's the spirit of joy on you. Are you, you laugh a lot? Sometimes, get used to laughing at things, okay? Get, get used to laughing at things. You may not understand now, just remember those words. Come on, let's just pray one more moment. Just one more moment. Come on.